What's going on guys? Hope everybody's doing really well. Video today on the web and how web browsers work. So I know everybody uses Chrome all the time. I'm on it 24 seven. I have it open all day, every day, literally. And the purpose of this video is to walk through the flow of what exactly happens when you type youtube.com enter on your web browser, all right? And how do you go from typing that and seeing something on the screen? Another developer actually downloaded the source code for Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, a lot of popular web browsers, and she literally debugged, built, debugged, and looked through the source code of all these browsers, millions of lines of code, and shared all her findings with us. So I have the article linked in my description. A lot of the info from this video I got from that article. If you want more details, please just go check it out, all right? Before we get started, I just want to have a quick disclaimer. I think before watching this video, you should have a basic understanding of how the internet works. No basic words like HTML, CSS, because I'm gonna use those words a lot. Um, if you don't know those words, just maybe look it up real quick or else the video is not gonna make too much sense, all right? But there's your warning. If you're ready to understand how web browsers work, let's do it. First things first, we're just gonna run through the basic components of a web browser. Here's a picture as a reference real quick, and let's just first as a summary go through all the different blocks. Number one is the user interface. Pretty self-explanatory, all those buttons you're used to, the back button, the forward button, the address bar. Number two is the browser engine. This actually facilitates communication between the UI and the rendering engine. We're not gonna talk about this block all too much, but hang on. Third one is the rendering engine, and this is actually gonna be the focus of this video. So this engine actually does a lot, a lot of stuff, which we're gonna talk about more, but it's pretty much taking all that HTML, all that CSS, and putting something on the screen for you. Fourth and next is the networking block, which is one of the key components that the rendering engine actually uses. The networking block usually uses HTTP and requests stuff all over the internet, right? HTML here, CSS there, it just gets everything. Another thing the networking block also does is it makes a lot of calls to DNS to resolve domain names. All right, so this is also a really important part, but we won't talk about it too much, but it does a lot of networking. Fifth component that the rendering engine uses very often is the JavaScript interpreter. As you all know, if you've developed any web page before, there's a shit ton of scripts running all the time on a web browser. So you need a really, really fast way to interpret and execute a lot of that JavaScript. And we're gonna talk more about that really soon. Sixth is our UI backend. We're not gonna talk about this. This is really out of scope for this video, but all you have to know about the UI backend is it pretty much does the real drawing of a lot of different things on your computer. You tell the UI to, I wanna see a rectangle, and you're gonna see a rectangle on your monitor, okay? And that's all we have to know for that part for this video. Seventh, last but not least, we have a data persistence layer on the browsers because browsers also save a lot of information. Every time you go to a website and you log in, you click that remember me, that's actually saving a little bit of data on your browser. So these are actually called cookies. The browser also saves random data like your search history that you clear very often, but there's always a set of data that the browser keeps itself and that's that persistence layer. All right, so that completes it for the basic overview. All right guys, if you're ready, we're gonna start getting into the real guts of the video. As I mentioned earlier, we're gonna focus on the rendering part of the web browsers. There's a lot of different components as you've seen, but rendering is so complicated that we really can, we're just gonna focus on that for the rest of the video. I broke it up into five distinct steps. We're gonna do them one at a time, all right? And let's just get started. Step one, pretty simple, it's just gonna be resource gathering. We wanna display something, we need something to display, all right? And for a web browser, that's gonna be web pages. So the whole point of resource gathering is the web browser uses its networking module to just get all the different resources on the internet. It includes HTML files, CSS files, pictures, all that stuff. We're just gathering resources, all right? So that's pretty much it for step one. All we have to do is get what we need to display. Step two is gonna be parse HTML and create a DOM tree. And what does that mean? So if you've ever seen or wrote HTML before, I'm sure you know it gets pretty crazy. There are a lot of tags 
there's more tags nested inside those tags, and there's more tags nested inside those tags, right? So there's a huge kind of like tree structure that HTML creates. I hope you guys can understand how the nesting kind of inherently makes a tree-like structure, right? We start at this root node, and we kind of have tags inside that root. And those tags have more tags, and those tags have more tags, and it, it essentially just fans out from one central place, all right? Creating a tree. Once we create this tree, it's gonna consist of DOM elements. DOM stands for Document Object Model, and the whole tree is made up of these elements. DOM, the document object model, it's a very official thing regulated by this thing called, this organization called the W3. You guys can check it out if you have some spare time, but it's all very official and documented really well. So read more about that if you're interested. One cool thing about this step that's pretty cool is that since HTML is really, really flexible, this parsing is also really flexible. So oftentimes developers we write really shitty HTML, right? We forget to close a tag, we misspell some things, maybe the nesting isn't quite right. Well, actually the browser can handle a lot of shitty HTML. When you forget a tag, for example, it doesn't just break the whole page. There's a ton of error checking inside this parsing, which lets the browser be very flexible about errors developers make. So that, that, that's actually a really cool part of this step because you can actually write kind of bad HTML and it'll still look right. Just to reiterate, the whole purpose of step two is to get all those resources from step one, all that HTML, and we're gonna create a tree of DOM objects. Okay, step three is taking our DOM tree and creating this thing called the render tree. So after step two, we downloaded all this stuff, we parsed all this HTML and created this tree-like structure. Now we have to add some style to it. Not only did we download HTML, but we also downloaded CSS, cascading style sheets, and those actually define tons of different styles and styling attributes to all the elements inside our tree. So the major purpose of this third step is to take all those styles and apply them to the right elements in our tree. One cool thing that happens during this step of translating the DOM tree to this render tree is that the render tree only contains elements that you can actually see visibly. One really common attribute of HTML tags is setting their display to be hidden. So you can hide tags by just saying hidden. And when you say something is hidden, it's gonna actually exist in the DOM tree, but it's not gonna be translated into the render tree because the code knows that, oh, I don't have to render that because they said it's hidden. So that's kind of a tricky difference. You have your DOM tree of all these different elements. It gets translated to a render tree of what actually needs to be seen. Step four is laying out the render tree. So at the end of step three, we have this crazy new tree with all these different styles, right? But where the F do they go? We need to position them and give them size so we can actually put them somewhere. During this layout step, everything is in the context of a box or a square or a rectangle, but there are a couple different ways to describe a box, right? You could give it four different points or you could give it one point with dimensions. So hopefully you guys have an intuitive sense of what this step is doing. Step three, put all the styling into one render tree and step four is figuring out their exact position and where they go on the screen. So that's step four, layout. And I like that word layout, it's a pretty cool word. So step four. The fifth and final step of this whole process is called painting and it's pretty much taking all that information and sending it over to the UI backend to actually draw on the monitor or let you see it. The core UI backend, I'm a little fuzzy on this, I don't know all the details behind this, but pretty much what happens is the core UI goes all the way into your operating system or down to your graphics libraries and actually uses draw functions to get things onto the screen. So you tell the UI, I wanna see a circle, I wanna see a polygon, or I wanna see a rhombus, and it's gonna draw a rhombus for you. Oh yeah. One other cool thing that this UI or drawing part or this painting part does is handle the Z dimension. So during layout, everything is laid out on the X, Y, but also you have this concept of a Z dimension for stuff that overlaps. So imagine two boxes and they actually take up the same amount of space, but one box is over, or you see that one box over the other box. 
the UI engine has to be smart enough to recognize what's over and what's under so you don't display this guy. So that's another cool thing it does. Okay, so that was step five, taking all that layout information, all the style information and giving it to the UI backend to actually physically draw so you can see it on your monitor, all right? And that's called painting. All right, guys, so that was a basic overview of the five steps during the whole rendering process. And we're gonna talk about some afterthoughts now because I wanna show you how difficult this really is. So one of the core reasons that web browsers are so complicated is that this tree, all the trees that we described, the DOM tree, the rendering tree, that stuff is constantly changing when you're on a web page. Just imagine this, you press a little button on the web page, right? What that little button does, it actually executes a script that changes the tree structure. The web browser has to recognize this change in this tree structure ASAP and re-render everything so you can see what happens after you click that button. This not only happens when scripts are running, you're clicking buttons and different things happening, but imagine just dragging your web browser with your mouse. Every time you drag the web browser with your mouse, it actually has to re-lay out some stuff, right? Things don't just stay in place when you drag stuff around. I'm sure you guys noticed that when you drag your browser around, stuff actually changes. There's probably, there's teams of people working on each web browser, working on different components of the web browser, probably writing millions of lines of code to do the right thing for their component, and it all comes together in this Chrome button we click on our screen that we have open 24-7. All right, guys, it's a pretty long video, but I think that's enough for today to give a basic overview of how web browsers work and how they render things. If you're interested, for First thing you can do if you're interested is check out the article in the description and then Google for anything extra you wanna know about. If you have any questions, just leave me a question. Please like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you didn't subscribe it and have a great week. All right, take care.